Okay, so um, uh, welcome to the uh, SOAS Centre of Taiwan Studies uh, Summer School. Uh, this is the uh, 11th uh, SOAS Centre of Taiwan Studies uh, Summer School. We started the, uh, these summer schools back in uh, 2007. We've run them every year with one uh, uh, exception. We, we started off doing these summer schools with uh, quite uh, brief uh, sessions. I think we started off with maybe a, a day and a half. Um, and the, but the, it's, kind of, it's kind of expanded uh, over time. So the last few years we've done um, uh, five, five days. Uh, so, um, and, and what we try and do um, uh, each year is to uh, have a number of different, different themes. Um, this year I think is probably one of our most kind of focused themes. Um, looking at issues related to Taiwan's uh, contemporary indigenous uh, people. That's our big focus. Uh, this uh, this year, um, the project is something that um, it's a two-year project looking at uh, issues related to Taiwan's uh, indigenous peoples. Um, that's and it's sponsored by the the, the Shunyi Museum. So it's, it's the third time we've worked with the, uh, the, the Shunyi Museum. In the past, we've we've done very historical projects with with Shunyi, but this this time uh, we're looking at contemporary um, uh, issues. Okay, um, I think they're the main things I want to say. It's, um, the other, perhaps the other thing I would also encourage you to um, uh, to join is the student session. So one of the things we've tried to do in the summer school um, is to um, have student research presentations, uh, and we'll do those on the, uh, the Thursday uh, morning. And uh, it's a chance for our master and uh, year one PhD students. Uh, to talk about their research uh, designs, and then the, the, the academics, but also the um, uh, audience members will help give them feedback on how they can improve their uh, research uh, designs. We've had some slight changes to the uh, agenda uh, to take a, uh, account of the um, uh, World Cup football uh, developments. <laughs> um, but I think, um, um, uh, now I think on ch uh, Tuesday evening now is, is free, so we're um, but the big change that we just made yesterday was that we um, uh, we've cleared the agenda um, for the uh, the Wednesday night. So uh, this this year I've been trying to um, make predictions for the, the World Cup. But my predictions have been um, fantastic. The, uh, the one error I've made is uh, predicting England. So I, I, I thought okay, England are going to go out first round. But, um, they will go um, out for sure. Oh well, hopefully. hopefully. Um, so, um, so now um, we will finish on time, on the more or less on time on the on the, on the Wednesday. Okay. Um, on that note, I'm going to hand over to my uh, my co-director, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dombi Yu. She, uh, we kind of co-created this summer school back in 2007. Um, and um, uh, and B, you want to say a few kind of opening remarks as, as well? Thank you. I have to say, this is not uh, really expected. You, you guys don't supposedly to be, uh, you know, being imposed upon with our remarks, welcome remarks, but do welcome you. Uh, um, um, this is quite an, a special occasion for us because every year it, the figure grew, or the days grew. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing is, um, last year we can expect a really bigger number because last year's topic was popular culture. Oh, sorry, popular music, right? And uh, uh, for us, uh, actually in the last two years, we were um, mainly uh, popular culture and popular music. This year, we were pleasantly surprised when we see the registration figure. I know it doesn't look like it right now, but they welcome, okay? Um, now it's over 100. So even with a niche sort of market, with a very concentrated uh, topic, we are um, now got this experience of actually attracting more concentrated uh, audience. So this is quite a good experience. Um, uh, actually, I did prepare something uh, sort of because I know I won't be re repeating what David said because usually he has a very overall view on, on the summer school. So I'm just. Uh, like to say uh, a big welcome to you guys, and uh, uh, 
I want to brag a little bit about the center because the, the center is the place that you can uh, build up some sort of connection and also certain kind of friendship here. Uh, this is a place outside of Taiwan, you have a certain kind of Taiwan study communities. I wouldn't say it, it's uh, just Taiwanese community, I would say it's still academically focused, but it's definitely a place that you can seek resources, ask advice, and also make friends. So this is the place to be, like we always say. So uh, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, uh, we welcome you uh, uh, to enjoy the f next five days. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I suppose another thing I should should say is that, uh, just to kind of follow up on, on B, that um, one of the things we really like is for um, scholars to come here, to so on to speak, but also then to uh, to come back uh, to give um, uh, repeated talks. So I can see, um, and also we have um, uh, former students. We have a number of former students who have also been speaking. And um, so, for example, uh, Nikki uh, at the University of uh, Central Lancashire uh, is our former student and a regular uh, speaker. Um, and uh, we'd like to welcome back uh, uh, Ian Inkster. <laughs> Uh, um, one of our uh, research uh, associates, uh, who's, who's again someone who's worked so us multiple times, and we're delighted that he's joined the teaching team. Uh, we have one of our, um, another one of our graduates, uh, Adam, here, who did MA Town Studies. He, so he's just back, just just graduated, um, and uh, he's also a professor at George Washington University. Georgetown. Georgetown University. Right. Sorry. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> Um, so he's going from being a, a, one of our MA students to actually uh, um, one of our, 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 our speakers. And of course, we also have uh, Darrell Sturk, who's, who's returning uh, for his second uh, SOAS uh, talk. Uh, in his first talk, he was based at uh, National Taiwan Normal University. National, National, National Taiwan University. Uh, and now he's at Hong Kong. Yeah, Lingnan. Uh, Lingnan. Yeah. Okay, so again, someone else uh, returning. But we also have... Uh, and we have a, uh, let's see, we have someone from uh, Berlin, uh, Chil Daida, who was in our audience um, uh, uh, last year, so he's here for the, the, uh, the second time. But we also have a lot of um, uh, speakers and audience members that are here for the, uh, the first time. We, we really welcome you to the SOAS Taiwan Studies uh, family. Okay, so we can move into our, uh, our first um, uh, speaker, uh, Professor Aoi uh, Mona from uh, National Donghua uh, University. Um, when we were starting to set up this, this project, um, uh, Aoi Mona was one of the first people on, on our list. And I, and I should say that the, um, uh, a lot of the credit for our list of for speakers for this summer school uh, goes to my wonderful uh, co-worker, uh, uh, Huang Chia Yue. Uh, so uh, she did the job of, kind of persuading speakers um, to come to SOAS, but also to setting up um, the agenda. Um, uh, and she, she's not only a, um, our research assistant, but she's also a, a final year PhD student at, um, at, at UCL. So, um, Professor uh, Aoi Mona, his, uh, his research area is, is law. So he, he did his PhD in yeah. the University of Washington yeah. in, um, uh, in Seattle. Um, and he's someone, uh, like I think I would say a lot of our speakers over the last few years, who uh, combines uh, academic life, but also um, involvement in social movements, and also in uh, governance. Uh, so for example, one of the areas that he's been involved in is uh, the Presidential Office Indigenous Historical Justice and Transitional Justice Committee. Um, and we also see the subcommittee uh, is land claims. So a really super um, um, uh, topical and controversial uh, area to be uh, involved in. Um, he did his PhD in, uh, in law um, and was the first indigenous person to actually get a PhD in, in law, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's going to be doing two, two talks. Um, and uh, this one here is his uh, chapter talk on indigenous movement uh, prospect, prospects towards indigenous nation building. So let's uh, give 
uh, Arimoto, very big SOAS welcome. <laughs> I still get used to the temperature of the London, so I'm sweating, but I'm not nervous. It's just too, it's just too hot. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank for the SOAS this invitation for me to London, and this is my one of my dreaming city want to be visit, and this is my first trip to to London because I spend most of my time in the uh, America and the South Pacific area. So I'm very excited and I did enjoy London so far. Because I could, we, my wife Lee and there, we came in early last week and we spent a week in London, see a lot, see a lot of things. Uh, my talk here, uh, because the, the giant has uh, uh, explained to me that we need to have two talks. One is more like introductory for the indigenous peoples in Taiwan and another thing is more like a research uh, topic. So this I will uh, identify it as an introductory for the indigenous law development in Taiwan. And I'm from the Sadic peoples. So Daryl, Darren, Darren, yeah. Darryl. Darryl, yeah. He, his many research at present is on our uh, people's language translations. And actually I'm from the Aram Gurubam, so I'm not sure uh, any of you seen the movie, uh, Sedek Balai. Mm -hmm. So that's the village uh, I come from. Okay, so, and I'm from the Sedek Taya, and my village we call Aram Gurubam. And I'm right now teach at National Donghua University. Okay, so my talk today, uh, I will uh, divide it into many five parts. So the first, I would start with the historical backgrounds, and this the uh, historical development. How does the different uh, colonial, even the governing regions, has interacted with indigenous peoples, and based on this development, which trigger a number of different phases of indigenous movement in Taiwan, which led to the emerging and evolvement of indigenous rights. And especially what I'm looking at is after two years ago, the right now President Chai Ing-wen, uh, she gave the national apology to indigenous peoples. And a lot of peoples, including myself, see this will be a turning point, might be another, uh, another uh, opportunity for us towards the self-government as a nation. That's why I get this uh, topic as an indigenous nation building. So everything from my point of view, because I, I was trained in law and I mainly <coughs> teach, study and research in indigenous law in general in, and also in other field of laws. So, but to start with the, the core issues, we have to identify what is indigenous peoples. I, I think is every country who has the, which has indigenous people, we always have to debate on what's the concept and idea of indigenous peoples. So how do we conceptualize indigenous people has always been a controversial debate in Taiwan. And I will come to this point in the end of my talk. So a lot of different, I just say, in, in academia, uh, someone from a social field or a cultural aspect or economic or a po political, we all have different aspects to define or position. How does the indigenous people in the structure of Taiwanese societies? And once you take uh, one aspect that might influence the rights which can be can be attached to indigenous peoples. But any of these, I mean social, cultural, economic and political, always have to be constructed by law. So in any event, 
from my point of view and also from the history from the uh, in, indigenous people with the different phases of uh, governing regimes. Different, I mean, colonial government always develop or create a legal fiction. How, how do we understand indigenous peoples? And this legal fiction has a very uh, has a very detailed discourse based on the colonial legal source. So, I mean, this is the, I think I would explain with this chart here. Because in Taiwan, even right now we call ourselves as indigenous peoples, Yuan Zumin. But this term was only started to use, started in 1994. But in 1997, the constitutional reform added Zhu, added S to the indigenous peoples. So we can say in Taiwan, legally speaking, Yuan Zhu Min Zhu only exists only 20 years, right? It's 2018. So from 1997 to 2018, legally speaking, Yuan Zhu Min Zhu only existed for 20 years. But before that, we as the government has used the mountain compatriot or the Sandi Tongbao, use this term to identify indigenous people as Sandi Tongbao for half century, 50 years. And before that, there were a very short period during the Japanese occupation, they used the Takasokuzoku, Gaosatsu. But before that, we can see since the first contact until the pre 1930, the year, the Usha. Accident, Different colonial regime, they only used savage people to identify indigenous peoples. So there is an untold story hidden behind all these names. And all these different names have led to a different outcomes for indigenous peoples, especially on their rights development. So let's have a discussion here. So how or what do you think different names or different legal position in the national legal structures, how does that influence indigenous rights protection? Like the Fanren, Savage, Gao Sha Zhu, San Bao, Yuan Zhu Min Zhu. All these different names has different outcomes, like I said before. But if we compare to other countries, especially those common law countries, it's very weird because my first time to England, my, my wife and, and I visit the Nat Nature, and, Nature and History Museum. There's a Charles Darwin Center. And when, on our way to the college hall, I saw a wall saying that Charles Darwin used to live here in one of the units in an, another building. So, in the common law countries, Charles Darwin's theory has actually influenced the colonial regime's expansion to Americas, to Africa, across the globe. So, what does that theory has brought, has bring to the indigenous people across the globe? The idea of wild men and other tales. So, the colonial regimes they identify indigenous people as wild men and they create a number of different tales. So, and all this, my conclusion is, all these different names is the purposive political languages. The government want to classify others, like wild men, barbarians, savages. And even in the, po uh, like, like 16 or 1800, we can see other countries Although they, dis, they discard these kind of symbols, but they still develop a, a different series, like stages of development. So savage people has the noble and ignoble differences. And once this has been completed, and then the government incorporate international law. Like the doctrine of discovery and conquest, this has been incorporated with the identification of indigenous peoples. So once we identify you are a savage people, you are a 
barbarians, which means you don't have a right to be a human. As a human, then you can have a right to own property. So, doctrine of discovery used by the colonial regime when they expanded to the Americas. They said, those lands are terra nullius, no man land. This theory has been used in Australia. So, this is one of the earliest theory when for the colonial regimes to occupy indigenous lands. And in the later stages, other countries from use the imperialism to colonialism, even the cultural colonialism. So all these different theories, like in Taiwan, when we compare the different stages of the names which was given by the government, the San Di Tong Bao, Yuan Zhu Min, Yuan Zhu Min Zhu, we can see naming as a legal tool with the political aim. Because in Taiwan, during those 50 years, when the ROC government, when the Taiwanese government identified us as a San Di Tong Bao, which means we are in the early stage of uh, uh, civilizations. So during those 50 years, the government, they carry out a number of different assimilation policies, make the mountains like the plants. So they want to make the people living in the mountains just like the people living in the plants. So what's the justification for the government to do that? That's the, the only thing is because they identify us as the early stage of the civilization, just like Australia, New Zealand, and Americas. So this cultural imperialism if we take the Australia as an example, international law was a form of cultural imperialism. So like Australia is morally illegitimate to the extent that it is founded on European denial of the continent's prior ownership by indigenous peoples. So they kind of classify Australia people. So Australia, Australia Aboriginal people started to turn the situation around once the marble decision was granted in 1992. So combine all this together, the government, why they want to name indigenous people? And they use the idea of progress, progress. So it's like the Charles Darwin. So the idea of progress they have three different stages. The first is the government started the denial narrations of indigenous culture. And then they assert the white people or the governing races is more superior. And then the government stigmatizes the indigenous cultural differences, which we, if, we, if you guys understand the history of Taiwan, during the 1960 to 1990, which is the indigenous movement, a lot of indigenous people during that generation is like the, uh, how to say it in English, Ren Tong the Wu I see. Understand? <laughs> anyway, it's like if you. Re if you, uh, if you admit you are an indigenous people, you will be tagged an uh, inferiority. Mm -hmm. So which make the people doesn't want to uh, show his identity as indigenous peoples. Because the government has already shown that if you wear like indigenous people, talk like indigenous people, eat like indigenous people, and you are inferior. Okay. So that's why our president, when she delivered the national apology, she has the following <coughs> lines. She said, the Dutch and the Guo Xing Ye Kingdom massacred and exported the Pingpu ethnic group, and the Qing Empire presided over bloody confrontations and suppressions. Colonial Japan put in place comprehensive savage policies and the post-war ROC government undertook assimilation policies. For 400 years, every regime that has come to Taiwan has brutally 
violated the rights of indigenous people through armed invasion and land seizure. For this, I apologize to the indigenous people on behalf of the government. So you can see the black letters I emphasize. So this is that then the question is why the government can do these things to indigenous people? On what ground? On what ground? Especially in the post-war period, it's already 20 centuries. The international has already in place. So I, I don't have time to make the translation for, for this map, but this map is from my work with the presidential office on the indigenous uh, transitional and historical committee. So this is what I have done, the research from di different periods. So this map shows the Qing Dynasty. For the green part, is controlled and managed by the indigenous people. And the second one is during the early Japanese period. You can see our land has been shrunk down a little bit. But until right now, our land has been protected under the law. It's all those already. So you can see it's only like 300 years only. And so it changed to that. So the next part is based on these past discussions. The indigenous movement has led to the constitutional reform and legal constructions. But all this we can see is like an international trend. So Taiwan is not working alone. Indigenous people in Taiwan are working together with international indigenous peoples. Because in 1972, the UN launched this comprehensive research the topic for research is on the problem of discrimination against indigenous populations. So under this topic, under this title, the dis discrimination against the indigenous people is not a domestic in issue. It is an international issue. And when, the, when this report completed in 1986, we can see a lot of uh, a research outcome from this report has been brought to Taiwan indigenous movement. Like, we, we, we started to claim, not only for reservation land, we started to claim the government should sign a treaty with indigenous peoples. In Taiwan, we are not only a claim for social welfare, we claim we are independent nations. We have the right to self-government, we have the right to self-determination. So based on this international trend, we can see the three waves indigenous movement in Taiwan. The first wave is from the 1980s to 1990s. And during this first wave indigenous movement, the outcome is the government finally made the constitutional reforms. But this not only by indigenous peoples. If you understand the Taiwan's history, the martial law was lifted in 1987. So indigenous peoples are co-work with the general social movement which com completed the comprehensive constitutional reform. And because of the constitutional reforms, and we have the first indigenous legislation uh, enacted in 1987, which is, is the Education Act for Indigenous Peoples. And the second wave indigenous movement is from the first changing power in Taiwan history. <laughs> the year 2000 through 2016. So for the first turn of the changing power, we can see the then president, the president from the DPP, he signed a new partnership with indigenous peoples. And the president Chen also declared the Taiwan government has a nation to nation relationship with indigenous people. A lot of people making fun of this political commitment because they think it's just a lip service. There's no use for that. But in fact, those com political agendas, those political documents actually led to the outcomes in 2005. The legislature has enacted the Indigenous Peoples Basic Law, which is the most important legislation for Indigenous peoples right now in Taiwan. 
and because of the indigenous people's special law, which comes following a series of legal constructions. And the third wave of indigenous movement I observe is the 2016 onwards because the national apology was delivered to indigenous peoples and we are on this way to see what's going to happen. So from these three different phases of indigenous movement, we can observe that the rights to protect indigenous people are from the equal protection and anti-discrimination of individual rights towards indigenous self-definition and self-government because of the basic law. The basic law introduced a new legal paradigm for indigenous people, which includes indigenous people's right to self-government, which in Article 4. And also, in this period, we can see the law started to actualize indigenous legal traditions in other ways, customary laws. Because of this development, we can see a lot of indigenous cultural practices can be uh, uh, non-guilty because of the cultural, because the indigenous legal tradition has been actualized and has been applied in the court. So a lot of indigenous cultural practice used to be convicted as a crime against the law. Right now, is it non-guilty? And in the third phase is, if you see the past few years, Taiwan society has a lot of discussion on the new constitutional reforms. And we are also putting our agenda. We want indigenous rights to be constitutionalized. And this is also uh, laid out in the uh, political agenda. But the, the point is, we started to focus on collective rights rather than individual only. But I'm starting to think. Uh, but uh, nothing comes easy, right? So if we look back to the history, this year is already 30 years since the first indigenous rights allocation organization was established. 30 years already passed. And it's already 20 years since the constitutional revision is already passed. And it's over 10 years since the enactment of the Indigenous People's Basket Law. Why I want to say this? Because especially the last part, the Basket Law has already laid out, just like I said before, it's a new legal paradigm for the rights of Indigenous people, especially on the rights of self-government. 10 years already passed. But we are still on our way to our nation building to carry out our right to self-government. So where is the problem? Or what's the issue here? But before that, because of this indigenous movement, we can see a lot of emerging and involvement of indigenous rights. By talking about the legal constructions, but we have to identify a multicultural dimensions to see this indigenous rights. Social, cultural, economic, and political. All this has been constructed into the law. So, like the social aspect, we can see there is the trend, the legitimization of indigenous legal traditions, just like I said before. And also in the social aspect, we are toward to develop a mechanism of free prior informed consent for indigenous peoples. So that's the social aspect. And the cultural aspect, we can see the implementations of cultural manifestations, expressions, and practices. And also another thing is self-governance on indigenous cultural heritages. 
in the political field, it, we have already established indigenous ad hoc tribunal to deal with indigenous legal issues. And also, we are on the way, but it's already written in the law, to establish the tribal council and to recognize the indigenous public juristic persons. That will be my second talk tomorrow, because the public juristic person is more, I mean, delicate legal issues. So there are a number of different things going on, emerging and evolving. But all this, if all this, even though we don't see the self-government this turn in this area. But if we combine social, cultural, political things together, it is another form or model of indigenous right to self-government. If we can have all this finalized. So last part, the national apology. But two years ago, when the president delivered this national apology, that year, from August to December, I was invited to a number of different occasions to talk about the national apologies. But the most common question I received from the audience, just like, why the president want to say sorry to indigenous peoples? Why? The second question is, can you tell me exactly who are the indigenous peoples? So these two questions has made me think about how does the general public see indigenous peoples? Because in a lot of in a lot of area, people think indigenous people just like disadvantaged minority peoples. So the key terms is disadvantage. But if we start to see indigenous people by taking this approach as disadvantages, then we will lose the whole pictures. The picture of what I have already explained to you, because you don't have to care about what happened in the history. We only focus on right now. But why the people will see indigenous people as disadvantaged peoples? Because in a number of social indicators every year, economically, educationally, health, jobs, employment, that kind of things, indigenous people more than 50% are lower or we can say it's like in the poverty line or below. So the people will see you are a disadvantage, economic disadvantage, educational disadvantage, health disadvantage. And another thing is government has poured a lot of resources to support this social development, which make the people think the, what is the differences between indigenous peoples and non-indigenous people? In my just poverty issues, in my just the allocation of resources. If we deal with the resources allocation appropriately, then we might we might say we have done a good job on indigenous peoples. Then we don't have to care about the land issues. We don't have to care about uh, the cultural issues. We don't have to care about everything. So, just like this, when the president delivered the national apologies, just like I said, a lot of people don't get the idea why and how. Because they are stuck in these issues, right? 
if we think indigenous people is just like disadvantaged group or minority group, and then we can actually use the theory of equality socialization, socialization of equality, by taking an approach like the affirmative action or majors to make it right, to make it transform, to improve the disadvantaged status. So once this status, the disadvantaged status vanishes, then what's left? But we still don't see the indigenous peoples. So what's the difference between the indigenous peoples and the non-indigenous people? Is the core issues I would like to share with you today. What's the nature? The nature of the indigenous differences. So, let's kind of jump to, to, this, to this. Maybe we can start up this. So, like I said, we have the indigenous people spectral in place since 2005. And since then, we have a number of different policies, majors, laws has been constructed culturally, socially, politically. And all this led to the indigenous self-government. But how can indigenous self-government come to success? So we have to focus on the indigenous differences which manifested through our cultural characteristics the cultural distinctions. Because we said the concept of good governance, the good governance, it is very important. It is compatible with our cultural characteristics. Because basic controls of indigenous rights were determined by the historical practices, customs, and traditions integral to the culture of the particular indigenous peoples. Just like politically development, like I said before, indigenous people's basic law has already said that we could form our public juristic person. We can be identified as a juristic person. So if you understand the law, you can understand why that is so important. Yeah. So, but do we want to be just like other public juristic person, or we can have our own? Because in Taiwan, in the show version, public juristic person only have three types. The first type is the nation state. The second type is the government, central government and local government. And the third type is Right now, we call it the Xing Zheng Fa Ren, administrative juristic persons. So, these three types of juristic person is already in place. But our law doesn't say what kind of juristic person we could be. So, either way, we can choose three of them, or we can create our own. But by choosing three of them, can we be nation state? Then we can claim independence, right? Then we can be nation state. But we can also be central government or local government. Taiwan is such a tiny land. And our people only occupy 2.3%. I believe some of you might visit Taiwan. Let's say there is a very famous uh, tourist spot we call Samang Lake. Samang Lake. Samang Lake is the traditional territory of the South people. The South people has only like less than 600 peoples. A few weeks ago, the government, uh, the government, announced 
proclaimed the tr traditional territory of the Sao people, which not only include the Samung Lake area, also include the neighboring counties. And then the neighboring counties government, they want to protest to the central government, saying that how could our land be claimed by a less than 600 people saying that that's their traditional territory, right? So can we choose to be a local government? We can, but there's my deal. Surely will be a lot of political confrontations. And then can we be Xing Zheng Fa Ren, an administrative jurist person? We could, we couldn't, because different, different types. So the actually in Taiwan, from the stand of the government, they actually want our Bulo, the community, to be the far end of the government, the very, very far end. So we have central government, county government, and also we have a Chunli. And they want us to be lower than the most lower uh, administrative bodies. Of course, we refused. And then, what choices we have? So my point of view is, since the law does not limit our imaginations, and then we can use the law to create our own public juristic persons. And then, what kind of public juristic persons we should be? I have I don't have the final model yet, but we must consider this as the first priorities. Because I believe the indigenous governance has to be compatible with our cultural integrity. Like we have 16 indigenous nations in Taiwan, we have more than 700 tribal communities. Do we want to be all look the same? Or you want to be your own? and then you have to use your imaginations. But at least we can come back to our cultural characteristics. Because a lot of things going on in Taiwan, indigenous peoples, we are followed by our historical practices, customs, and traditions, which are integral to the culture of particular indigenous peoples. So our visions of governance is this a kind of nation building. But by saying the nation building, we are not saying about a Western model of nation building. We have to find out the attributes of governance attaching to those practices. Because a formation of a cultural match governing system and in the ongoing function of that system will be our job to create our self-government model, our vision of governance. So, back to this chart here. Because in our constitution saying that the additional article 10, paragraph 11 and 12, saying that the government respect the multiculturalism and the government should foster the development of indigenous languages and cultures. And the paragraph 12 to the additional article 10 saying that the government should follow or should respect the will of indigenous nations to self-government to a number of different areas like social, cultural, education, development. So the idea in the constitution has already expressed the self-determination for indigenous peoples. But how could we, how can we, how can the Taiwan as a nation state to com complete the idea of multiculturalism? Taiwan is not only, Taiwan does not only have one racial group. Taiwan has a lot of different ethnic groups which make, up, make us a diversity society. When when we talk about indigenous peoples, 
we are not forced, not indigenous peoples. So we have to find balance. So the this idea of multiculturalism, I think once we have we if we want to have this complete, the inner circle is that each nation should enjoy substantially equal and completely effective self-government. And in the middle, we have to legitimize of so generous rights and its full realizations. It's not, not only for indigenous people. We have to find a particular ethnic group, what kind of so generous rights they should attach to their practices. So like Taiwan, we have, just like I said, 16 indigenous nations. We have uh, Hakka people, we have uh, Minam people. Right now, we even have newcomers, Xinjumi. So in the middle area, we have to find out, just like in Taiwan, I think the best example might be the language courses, which has been carried out in primary and secondary school. Our each student at school have the right to learn his or her own languages. So we are not only to learn Mandarin or English or others. So once the inner circle and middle circle has been complete, the, from the outlook, we can see there is a recognition and manifestations of multiculturalism as a constitutional value. Otherwise, we cannot <coughs> saying that the constitutional value has been implemented in Taiwan. So I always say that the value of Taiwanese constitution want to complete, the only way is to protect, to foster, to implement indigenous rights of self-government. But <clears throat> To finalize that, I think in the future, there is, since the president has delivered the national policies, for the past two years, we have seen, we have seen a lot of things going on. And I said that is a reconciliation among tribalism, constitutionalism, and cultural pluralism. And there will be a new phase of constitutional reform is at stake. Yeah. So my, the goal of this presentation is to study how indigenous communities come to be imagined as the nation and creating a society in which such independent nations within postmodern states can share power in the spirit of mutual respect. So it, this conquer my talk today. And last words, Mahuai Manu Balai. Thank you. That was a, a fantastic kind of uh, overview of exactly the kind of thing we were uh, uh, looking for. So I have a lot of questions, but let me just kind of uh, start with one, one or two, that, uh, and then we can we can come back. Otherwise, take take this one, and let me give you some. So you talked about a um, a new phase of constitutional uh, reform. Um, and that made me think about um, something that a couple of our previous speakers have touched upon, um, and that's uh, political representation mm. of indigenous uh, uh, people. So I was thinking um, about the electoral system. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent is that something that you feel needs to be addressed in this next phase of um, um, constitutional reform? Because proportionally, uh, indigenous people have uh, a higher level of mm -hmm. political representation in the uh, Lifa Yuan. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, a number of our, of our speakers have suggested that this 
doesn't actually serve the interests of indigenous people mm -hmm. um, uh, particularly uh, well. Uh, many of the, the reforms that you've talked about over the last 30 years don't actually come from those indigenous elected politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, they come from uh, indigenous uh, social movements. So there seems, uh, are there any kind of proposals on how this element of constitutional reforms might actually be um, um, uh, addressed? Uh, a second question I had um, was you talked about a number of these three phases of constitutional reforms over the last 30 years. Uh, could you comment a little bit about um, the drafting process? Mm -hmm. So uh, where do these reforms come from? Are they from uh, indigenous uh, activists? So for example, um, let me just take w one example. You talked about the, the text of the apology. Um, uh, how was that actually drafted? But to what extent was there any kind of dialogue in the, in the drafting mm -hmm. of that, that text? Um, so that question really applies not just to that, that speech, but I think also to the content of um, many of these pieces of legislation. Mm -hmm. Who's actually doing the design of these, uh, these reforms? Mm -hmm. okay. So <clears throat> I think the, the idea about the electoral system I, from one of my friends. Oh, uh, OK, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, he he probably devoted most of his academic life in in this area. So, uh, of course, I I, I agree with what about your um, your question about the political representations, mm -hmm. uh, because the, just like you said, proportionally speaking, we are our seat is more more than our population yeah. ratios. So. The idea is, um, if we have more seats, I think the, the core issue is not how many seats you have. It's more like what kind of uh, power or decision-making decision authority you have in the legislatures. So on, 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 one, on, one, on one end, some people propose that we should have the ethnic representations. Like, uh, we have 16 indigenous nations, and then we, we surely can have uh, 16 seats in the legislatures. But that is very, very challenging and might not, uh, uh, how to say, it might not happen. Okay? So, another Another thinking is that, uh, like uh, me, myself, and other colleagues, we, we are now create another thing is like in the central uh, legislative realm, we can have the indigenous commissions. Like we have the social cultural commission, we have a national defense com commission. Okay. Because the commission decided what kind of uh, bills, right, they, they can start to discuss. So another thing is we, we are trying to create the indigenous commission mainly for indigenous representatives. They have the final set. Mm -hmm. So, and there's another way of thinking that once we have the constitutional reform or rewrite, uh, we want to create a new relationship saying that you have your own legislature, we have our own legislature. Mm -hmm. But we have to find out how do we allocate different powers, authorities, and affairs, that, that kind of things. Yeah, so it's like uh, the Canadian has Assembly of First Nations, but it's not like uh, legally uh, constructed. But in Taiwan, we are actually thinking to create a legal body just like uh, the Indigenous Assembly, yeah, to kind of parallel with the, our central government. So, and the second question is, uh, how does this, uh, all these drafts come out for like a national apology? I think uh, in Taiwan it's very interesting to see for the past uh, two or three years, a lot of things uh, actually, a lot of like um, people participate in the political activities from the sunflower. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I can say the national apology was drafted mainly by the the member. Can, can we say member? The sunflower member? <laughs> or, activists. Yeah, activists yeah. from the sunflowers. Yeah. So a lot of uh, indigenous activists, especially for the uh, uh, not the youth, not but the young peoples, okay. like like around thirty to forties. Okay. So they right. they are being invited to participate in the draft of national apologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then once they finish, and we move on to another group of people, like I am one of them, and to discuss. But the draft is mainly, so what I say is that a lot of things happen in Taiwan actually really has to go back to the, the sunflowers. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But, but if we go, uh, go back to the 30 years ago, the, the first wave of indigenous movement is, uh, actually there, there was a debate on uh, how do we? Uh, how can we uh, advance indigenous movement uh, from the tribally speaking or the urban speaking? Because a lot of things going on was in urban area, but uh, for but back that time, indigenous community was not that open, just like right now. So many of our indigenous leaders in the community they will criticize, saying that. The people uh, advance the indigenous movement in the urban area. They are the elite away from tribal communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So back that time, it's kind of there's the in inside debate. Yeah, inside debate. And, and do you have that challenge now? So, for example, if you go back to your home village, uh, are you, do you feel out of touch because you've been in Taipei for? Oh, sorry, no, you've been in the, at least in the uh, uh, university. Yeah. Actually, uh, if for myself, my, my experience, uh, uh, so you want me to confess right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, because my, my village is very small, but uh, I actually live outside of village since, uh, since I went to college. Mm. So before college, Actually, because, of, because my parents work around the village, so we kind of regularly back to village. Mm -hmm. It's not that, uh, it's, it is not that, um, how to say it, distance. Right, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. But, but you bring another issue is that 30 years ago, I just said there's a tribal thinking and urban thinking. Right now, we have uh, the U. Uh, uh, a lot of young people participate as an activist to advance the indigenous movement, but they have been criticized also. But they've been criticized by elders, uh, mm -hmm. tribally and in also the in in the city area. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the thing is, I uh, I one of the one of the reason might be because those. Uh, young people who participate as an activist, they they were born in the cities, and they 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 are more like uh, they receive the identity. They see themselves as indigenous people in the late period as they 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 grow up. So the 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 people will say that because they are in the forefront of this development. So they kind of like, because um, they interest mm -hmm. parties. Yeah, so they've been criticized by that. Yeah. Okay, let's open up to some questions. Oh yeah, be you. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, fascinating, I'm sorry, I have to drop out here and there. Um, I would like to ask, uh, because the, the way it was conducted, uh, uh, the apology, and I wonder, uh, from your perspective, what did it do? What's the significance for the uh, indigenous people themselves? And many people criticize the way it was done, was not really a true apology. But for you, what do you think? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Uh, 
Actually, in, in the beginning of the national apology, even when they drafted the text of the apology, uh, I feel at times I feel they are not doing, they are not really doing this thing. They are not really doing the apology. They are doing the political agenda, okay, gesture, yeah. Uh, especially when we compare to the Australia and the Canadian. Canadian, the Prime Minister de delivered the apology in front of the Parliament. And Australia also delivered the apology in the Parliament. And they have a national broadcasting, right? But in Taiwan, if you, but you can still see on the YouTube. We have been invited inside the presidential office, one of the conference room. Yeah. And we do have a national broadcasting, but only for indigenous TV television. Yeah. Only for indigenous television, we do the national broadcasting. But the thing is, uh, actually on that day, the fee is late. They broadcast not in a lifetime. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's very interesting. Yeah. So in that time, I feel it's like just polit politics. Yeah. Because we during uh, we have done a lot of negotiations. How do we do this national apology? In where to to whom? In what? In what form? Yeah, but everything we said has been, oh, we understood, and we take it considerations, but in the end, we, they're still doing those things. <coughs> but after that, uh, since our first presidential, uh, I mean, the indigenous committee, that's in the short term, indigenous community, our, our first uh, session of meetings, I, I was amazed because the president sit there with us for more than almost four hours. Yeah, for almost four hours, sit there and talk to, to us to explain uh, how she gonna run this. And in the first meeting, I was invited to give the first talk to, <laughs> to talk about indigenous self-government and how, how can we pursue and to give to give the committee some uh, suggestions. So since then, I, I, I can feel she commit to this work, but the government is big machine. Yeah, she, she might not be able to oversee everything. Yeah, but once she decided to focus on that, and then we, we, we see a, a we see a slight change over time right now. Yeah. But since it is not a legal body, this committee is not a legal body. It's the, like a consulting group for the pre presidents. Yeah. So, so we are using this uh, a channel, negotiation channel for the indigenous people with this government. Yeah. But uh, a, a lot of people, they, they just can't wait. They just can't wait. Yeah, so we we receive a lot of different crit, uh, criticize. Even right now, I'm 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 leading the subcommittee on land claims. Yeah, when I just complete nineteen sessions of a tribal community visit, and all these nineteen visit, I was in complaint. Yeah, can you be faster? Can you do this? Can you do that? Yeah. So if 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 I if I don't promise anything, then they, they say, oh, it's just a political gesture, yeah, just like that. But I think it's all we have to see the president's uh, commitment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ivan. Thank you. Okay. Um. Just a quick comment before I ask the question. I, I was in Paris last week, and amongst the exhibitions I saw was one on Neanderthal. Now, one of the curators of the exhibition said in a newspaper interview that uh, for sapiens, sapiens, that's all of us here, 
Um, I hope. Um, well, maybe I, maybe I hope not, because it would be nice if, if, if one of the other human species had survived. But um, <coughs> that, that, that for sapiens sapiens, Neanderthal is the original other. And in one of the, uh, the, the exhibition rooms, there was uh, a quote from uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, which states, uh, there's no such thing as a primitive culture, there's no such thing as an involved culture, there's just different uh, responses to recurring and identical problems. And I think that's um, a very interesting um, uh, idea that, that he's put forward and that's very relevant to, to what we're discussing this week. Um, but my, my question uh, concerns um, uh, more pressing issues. Um, for countries like Scotland, the Basque Country, uh, Catalonia, other places around the world, um, <coughs> the question, uh, national question, is, is relatively straightforward because most of these places are clearly defined and contiguous uh, geographical areas. Now that's not the case with, with the, uh, the, the indigenous nations in Taiwan any longer, although your map sheerly clearly shows that very recently it was. So maybe the stage is set for some serious innovation. Now, um, uh, the word democracy uh, is, is widely used, but very rarely defined. <clears throat> and, and you mentioned the idea of 16 uh, uh, assembly members. Um, <coughs> 16 assembly members can't do very much, can they? Uh, and there's no concept of sovereignty there. Um, so um, I think democracy is very often mistaken for majoritarianism. Majoritarianism is not democracy. So my question is, what do you see um, as a way forward in, in establishing uh, some kind of effective, lasting uh, national sovereignty for the indigenous peoples of Taiwan? <coughs> Sorry, it's a nasty question. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I think I'll start with the idea of democracy. Once I uh, I actually forgot what I got these lines about the democracy, but I, I recall it says democracy is a very of belief or a system of government. Democracy. So if we see the democracy is a value of belief we believe in, and then we should do my when we uh, when we deal with the indigenous issue based on the value of democracy, and then we might have another result. But we see democracy is a system of government, and then we just count the head, right? So uh, the way we want to claim the national sovereignty for indigenous people, like I just said, uh, actually. It, in a number of different indigenous people across the globe, uh, a lot of people, we, we, we must claim sovereignty first and a full and complete sovereignty to be a start when we talk to government. But in fact, it, it, might, not, it might just not gonna happen in reality, especially in Taiwan, because we are not only facing Taiwan government. Now, we are not just facing Taiwan government. Now, we are still a huge, a huge one on the other side of the Taiwan Strait. <laughs> so, but it is, I always talk to my colleagues, we could be we could be a, how to say it? We could use the relationship of the Taiwan Strait, Taiwan Strait to develop or to claim the most our sovereign status. Like one, there was one time there was a son of the indigenous ethics group, they say, we want to claim we want to recognize China. We want to refuse Taiwan. 
We want to make friends with China. We, want, we don't want to belong to Taiwan. And at other times, we said, we want to be friends to Taiwan, not China. So there's a very interesting relationship we can make use of it for the indigenous peoples. But at this period, actually, uh, next month, next month, August 1st, indigenous people from the government uh, cap uh, cabinet, we are launching Australian Forum to collaborate with a number of different countries from the Pacific area to create a new international platform for indigenous peoples. So I think why I want to say this is how much or to what extent we can have our sovereign status to be established. My, based on what kind of strategies we have. And right now, we are using the international platform because the US and China is not in a very, yeah, it, they are not good friends, which led to a lot of different <coughs> Pacific countries. They can be friends with us and only for indigenous peoples. So, in August 1st, there will be more than 10 countries to join this Australasian Forum to advance indigenous issues across the Pacific Ocean. <coughs> so in that way, I think we can have more bargaining power for us to negotiate with the Taiwanese government. But like I said, in the end, to what extent we can establish our sovereign status, I have no answers or at this point. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, Thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. Um, my question is is more to do with uh, going back to the indigenous difference that you were talking about, but more on the perspectives on the economic system. So I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit about how you feel the indigenous people are struggling against corporate power in, in regards to the land right question, um, especially in the case with Asia Cement in Toronto. Yep. Wow, you are very focused. <laughs> Asia cement. Yeah. <clears throat> Once again, I'm not nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't understand why you can wear the long sleeve. It's <laughs> <laughs> working now. <laughs> okay. And. I think the development issues on indigenous land is the common issue across the globe for indigenous peoples, like in Southeast Asia and also in Pacific Islands. And so that's, that's the same in Taiwan. Um, before the Asia cement cases, I think the earlier there's another famous case is in Taitung area. I don't know if you, you, you guys know, there's one uh, resort want to build up just on the beach just on the beach, and that beach is the, uh, I cannot say it's the most, but it is very, very beautiful beach. So the local government, lo the local county government, they just lease out to the corporate to develop for 50 years, okay? But that, that project is gone already, yeah, it's gone. But how can we make it vanish? It's all because we, you, we first, first, first thing is we make use of the, our law, our, our, our legal system. And another thing is we work with other friends. But those friends could be our enemy too. <laughs> so it, in Taiwan, the indigenous issues, we uh, like the, the hunting issues. On the other side, always the conservative bodies, environmental issues, right? So we have to find a way to find a common ground for our common interest. So like the Asia cement too, 
Because we, if we only focus on indigenous land issues, nobody will care. Or we can only receive a lower support. Because legally speaking, a lot of people will say, you indigenous people have already surrendered your right to the government or to the corporations, legally speaking. But if we look back to the history, low surrender has been the case of uh, deceive, yeah, or by other, by other means. So we started to receive a lot of sympathy from the general public, but sympathy cannot make things change. So luckily we have the Zebelin, Zebelin, cheap Wally. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Zebelin. Yeah. Luckily, we have his filming mm -hmm. scene in Taiwan. So that's the point we started to collaborate with the environmental group. Yeah. To deal with the Asia cement. And the third phase is we have this presidential office on indigenous community. And then we make the case. The president gave the not the orders. It, he she just saying that the government should invite indigenous peoples and corporations. We sit on the table to discuss how we gonna deal with this. So it, it is an issue going on. Yeah. But all these development issues happening in indigenous land. In the past, we have no, we have no tools, or we have we have no weapons to defend. But since the Basque Law enacted in two thousand and five, Article Twenty One, saying that any development, any land development, taking place on indigenous land, you have to consult first consult indigenous people. The second. After consultation, you have to receive the consent of from the local indigenous peoples. If you don't do this, then the project will not be carried out. Yeah, so it is gone. So that that is the case right now for the Salmon Lake, because the local government want to also. If you guys ever been to Salmon Lake, there are already you cannot count how many hotels around the Salmon Lake, but the local government still want to build up a huge resort. Yeah, so that, that project was in, in discussion for, for the EIA, in EPA, EIA, oh, environmental, environmental impact, impact assets. assessment. Yeah, yeah, assessment. So that project has been in the process of EIA. <coughs> yeah. So, but right now, because the government has already promulgated the South Traditional Territory, which includes that area. Mm -hmm. So even they already passed the EIA, they still cannot start the development. They still have to go back to do the Article 21 process. So what is the definition of consent? Is that, uh, how, how is that achieved? Is that through a referendum or? Yeah, it, actually it depends on the size of your peoples. Okay. So just like the South people, they have 600 peoples. They, they, have, they have to vote. Yeah, they have to, okay. they have to right. do right. that kind of things. But if you, if, if for Amish people, it's like 200,000 peoples. Mm -hmm. So it's not, so we have another thing is we, like I, I showed you there was a tribal council. Oh. So they do the tribal council and the representative of tribal council is from the village. So it depends on how many uh, communities you have. Mm -hmm. So they kind of they can represent the systems. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Daryl. Um, this is a follow-up question um, about uh, development. I'm just wondering if um, there are any cases in Taiwan of uh, Bulo-led uh, village community-led uh, development projects, uh, whether for national uh, natural resource extraction or uh, for tourism. Um, and if we haven't seen any such developments uh, so far, is it likely that we might see some in, uh, in the next few years? And I'm asking this partly because as a Canadian, 
Um, my main um, kind of impression of uh, Indian reservation in Canada was a hockey rink. They had a hockey rink there where we could go practice on the weekend. I, I played hockey, not very well, but we went out to the Mohawk reservation to, uh, for hockey practice, and it was one of the ways that the uh, reservation made money um, as a, a reservation. And the other uh, impression I had was a casino. They had a, a casino on the same reservation where they had uh, boxing matches. I wasn't interested in this when I was 12, but uh, later on I learned a little bit more about it. And then uh, it's uh, fundamentally a casino that was built by a company that the uh, reservation hired. So is it likely that we're going to see such developments uh, in Taiwan, or um, would uh, uh, Buloa-led developments in Taiwan take another uh, uh, form? Thank you. The simple answer is, of course, mm -hmm. it is going to happen. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, uh, it is very weird say, that you are saying the Buloa land or lease out the land for the development, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing right now is the Buro, the community, cannot be a proprietor of the land. We cannot own the land because we are not the juristic persons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyone who can own a property, uh, either you are a human being as a natural person or you are a person to be recognized by law, which we say juristic persons. So right now we have this law already in place. That's why I say it is going to happen. Mm -hmm. right? But the thing is, we still have to negotiate with the government. How could we or how can we uh, return the land to the mm -hmm. Yeah, It is all has to come to the issue is what is the public juristic person for Bulo? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, either way, just like I said, three different types you can choose, but either type, either type, is very weak for us. Either we cannot choose that, like a state, or we cannot be a local government because the county government will not tolerate that. So if you, uh, so then the only option you have is the far end. It's like a service delivery. Mm -hmm. You will be a service delivery for the county government because you are in the far end of the government. So if we choose that type, I have no faith that we could run our own land. You have no faith? or I have no faith. faith. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't believe that that's that going to happen. Because if you are just a service de delivery, mm -hmm. yeah then how could the government will say that, okay, let's demarcate this land for you, and you run it. Yeah. So that's why I said we have to create an imag imagination. We have to create a different types. Yeah. And that, that is the way we can, we can find, find out how could we do that. Mm -hmm. But before that, actually, under my work, with the indigenous community, actually, I have already uh, not 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 myself. Our team has f almost finalized a deal with our, one of the government agency. They used to manage that land, and right now they want they agree to return the land for the tribal community to use. Mm -hmm. But since the tribal community is not recognized as a legal person, so they will return the land for the indigenous agency, for the cabinet, the mm -hmm. Council of Indigenous People. So they will return the land for the Council of Indigenous Peoples, and then the council will find a way to give the land for the community to run. So it's more like uh, under a contract. Mm -hmm. So it is under a contract, but it's still not it, it is still not contract with the tribal community, I mean, Bulo. Mm -hmm. They, the contract, the, the contract will be signed under one of the um, association or uh, one of the organization from the Bulo. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, hmm? No, it's not in National Park. 
is is in Taitung area. It's a very beautiful uh, coast area. Yeah. So we find. So we almost finalized this deal. Yeah. So it's a mid success. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. Hi. Uh, so regarding the concept of the juridistic a uh, person, I wonder like how do the sixteen tribes imagine this idea? Like how is it through tribal councils, or like how are you going to reach sort of consensus on how we can imagine or conceptualize as nation? Because mm -hmm. I think even for the general public, in like for Minan people or Taiwanese people. Uh, by saying that I'm not excluding indigenous people as Taiwanese people, I just say like, how are you going to discuss all these differences? Because I guess sixteen tribes will have their own distinct cultures as well. Mm -hmm. I think that that that's the reason I didn't give you a model of uh, what the Jewish person should be for indigenous people. We because we have sixteen nations and more than seven hundred tribal communities. But for the government idea, the easy way is I create a model and every one of you, you just find a way to fit in. Yeah, and I think it's just the, the period uh, for the U.S. when they doing the IRA, Indigenous Reorganization Act. I create a tribal government and then if you want to be a tribal government, and then this is the model. You want it, you fit in. If you don't want it, then you, you are excluded. So right now in Taiwan, 16. So, but we still have a way for, for the community to discuss public affairs. It's like tribal meetings, tribal councils. So it is legally uh, uh, stipulated already in place. So, but it is just a mechanism for the tribal people to discuss. But it is not the final model for us to create our own juristic persons. Yeah, so I think we have a way to negotiate, to discuss, but what kind of juristic person should be, it is still depends on uh, different, different nations. Like, 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 uh, 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 like one time I, I actually proposed that uh, for the smaller, we, we cannot say smaller. For the pop, uh, population fewer. <laughs> for, for the nation who have fewer populations, they might just create what is that? The corporations, business corporations. Yeah. They might just have, because in Taiwan there are some. I think there are three, four, four or five indigenous nations. They have less than like six hundred peoples. I, if 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 we want them to create a government, it's gonna be huge. Everyone is government officials, <laughs> right? So another thing is we might create a corporations and people could be, how do say? Uh, shareholders, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, and the shareholder could become as a family or come as an individual. Yeah, so in that, that, that that's an, an, another way to do that. But if, if we want the, the nation has a 200,000 and more, they have a corporation, I, I don't think it's a good way for, for, for my thinking. So different nation might, should have different strategies. But we do have, for your question, we do have the mechanism to talk things. Yeah. But the result is still depends on different nations. Yeah. Okay, uh, Adam and then to you. Hi, thanks. I really liked thank you. Um, I really enjoyed uh, your talk, especially the emphasis on imagination and creativity. That's 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 great. Um, I have two completely distinct questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first, you seem to say that one of the successes of movements for cultural autonomy was that uh, indigenous children now can learn their own language, they have the right to, to, to study that in school. And um, my limited 
understanding is that there's, uh, there, there are real practical problems surrounding that. Literally, n not enough textbooks, not enough teachers, not enough people who are competent in the language to be able to, to actually do that. Um, even at the basic level of not having a written, codify, a codified, entirely agreed upon way of writing um, languages. That's, so my first question is, is basically about that. Um, uh, my second question, completely distinct, is you mentioned that uh, Chen Shui Bian had talked mm -hmm. about a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, and that I believe you said a lot of people laughed about at the time as just sort of an empty political gesture, but that it became to have sort of material reality in 2005. Again, speaking from ignorance here, but when I hear that, I'm thinking that Chen, is, that concept has nothing to do with indigenous people, but is intended to establish Taiwan as a nation. And, and, and so indigenous people are, are, are simply being used as a um, convenient metaphor for really something else. And I wonder the same thing about, um, you seem to be in favor of multiculturalism, and it's hard to be against multiculturalism, but <coughs> One reason why President Tsai might make an apology or promote multiculturalism is that there's a more important issue from Taiwanese perspective, which would be making Taiwan look like an open democratic multicultural society that respects international, you know, good things. And again, the point of that has nothing to do with indigenous people, but rather uh, other politics. Uh, so. I, I suppose if it produces material benefits, who cares, right? Um, but on the other hand, I would also imagine that one could feel like uh, one's being used somehow. Uh, so those are my three questions for you. Thank you. That's very brutal <laughs> comment. Thank you, though. So I think from the... From the uh, the first question is about cultural autonomy, and you say you are ignorant, but I say you are very professional because you know very detail about the situations in Taiwan. But that's the truth there, because even uh, I think last year we just uh, passed the legislation, which is Indigenous Language and Development Act. Uh, since this act in place, there are, I think the Indigenous language ability will be some will be some requirement for the indigenous people to participate in public uh, affairs. So having said that, uh, I think you, you are very uh, uh, you are you are right on the even now even though we are uh, promote uh, we are advance on the indigenous language development, but uh, the text and, and teachers we have a, a gap right now. And a huge gap. So uh, myself right now is also uh, doing another position, which is under the National Academy for Educational Research and the director for the Indigenous Education Research Center. It's weird, right? I'm in a low area, <laughs> but I'm running this center. So our center is not the only. Uh, agency to respons to responsible to to make this language uh, learning uh, more complete. But uh, I just finalized a new version of Education Act for Indigenous Peoples, uh, which might which might be passed maybe later this year or early next year. So one of the key uh, reform is focus on. The, the issue you, you mentioned. So we are trying to do the uh, teachers, uh, how does that, teacher? Teacher training? Yeah, teacher training and also the development of text and uh, sort of things. So that that's in progress. But by saying the cultural autonomy, uh, I like, uh, uh, right now we have a uh, other legislations right now in place which is more like self-government for indigenous peoples on cultural issues. One thing is that we have the we have uh, act 
uh, for the indigenous people, we can manage the traditional creations. It's like the indigenous copyright. Yeah. So this app is already in place. So uh, how does the people make use of indigenous uh, intellectual creations like songs, dances, and totems, uh, weavings? Yeah. So that that law has already granted a power and authority for indigenous peoples. Uh, when, how, the non-indigenous people can make use of our internet, yeah, intellectual creations. And another thing is that we have the Indigenous Cultural Heritage Act. Yeah. So which means the, because the cultural heritage has some kind of symbol for the national sovereignty. And the indigenous people has been excluded from this area for the past, uh, uh, for, for a long time. So also two years ago, we have passed this law. So the indigenous cultural heritage is another category under the cultural heritage. So a lot of things going on right now. Uh, what what uh, why I say uh, you your second comment is truly uh, open or expose the reality, okay? And you are very right. Even and I think it, it's it's a, a lot of people here. I think you you guys might have ver you guys might very knowledgeable on the political issues in Taiwan. I mean, the blue and the green. Yeah, so under the Kevin's eight years and compared to former eight years and right now the child's uh, turn, you can see very different on uh, different parties, how they, how they deal with the indigenous policies. And it is true the DPP used indigenous people as um, another as a symbol or a, polit a political uh, actions to declare or to demarcate the line between the Taiwan and China. It's very true. Yeah, it is very true. Yeah. So, like I said, the the August first, the coming August first, we will we will start it. Actually, it is not. It is not the opening for the Australian Forum. It is actually a reopen because the Australian Forum was a state bridge on the last year of the Chen's administration. So when his turns ends, the KMT turns came in and they closed the Australian Forum for the eight years. And right now, the TPP want to reopen it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, tweet. Hello. Thank you very much for your uh, informative uh, presentation. So the last question answered uh, part of one of my questions, though, which was a cultural one. Um, but it was also about, um, on the cultural side, um, I see a lot of commodification by uh, governments and cultural organisations of indigenous uh, activities around the world. So uh, uh, is this something that is easy to manage because it's also a, a, an income stream as well? That's one question. Um, the second one is, okay, there's three questions. The second one is, uh, which indigenous groups around the world uh, are, you, are, are you finding most um, best working relationships, like Maori, um, it's a, a cultural connection, isn't it? Um, Canada, Sami. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm speaking from a we, we screen indigenous film uh, in London, so I'm coming from a, a um, broadcast kind of a, a exhibitor uh, perspective of, of presenting cultures through film. Um, and what's the last one? Ah, do you find uh, from the non indigenous organisations, uh, do you find out of the United Nations groups, do you find is Enrit which one of those organisations seems to be the most to have the most action? Mm -hmm. But there's more questions. Thank you. Okay. So I think that the last question is um, uh, 
maybe I should say it, there's none. <laughs> because even when the UN opened up the PFII, Permanent Forum, started in 2000, I think 2004, in the early, early stage of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, it is truly an open, equal, and friendly platform for the indigenous people to participate in the UN in the UN organizations. But in the past, let's say maybe five or six years on, it's become just like the UN assembly. It's very, very political. Even so that, that's uh, one of the reasons I stopped to participating is I think one is the time issues, another is it because that area is become the political competitions, which means you have to be you have to be a major role internationally. Otherwise, you will have you won't have uh, any say in that in that meetings. Yeah. So in that case, if you are from a marginalized community of the marginalized, and then you won't have any place in that area. But we can, but we can still see a lot of things going on internationally by promulgate a number of different documents, uh, declarations, and actions carried out. So we we might say that the UNESCO might take the because I think the issue is like a very more soft one. Yeah, so in, in the UNESCO, they focus on the international and uh, indigenous uh, cultural issues, education issues. And I think that that's, uh, uh, might be another organization we, we, we can look at. Yeah.